Well, good morning. We're at creationism versus evolution. We're looking at, we did look at the worldwide flood, pointing overwhelmingly to a recent creation, a one time worldwide flood. Then that went into the Ice Age, and uh, evolutionary scientists or people uh, are tending to lean toward a single Ice Age instead of the four that they looked at are multiple, and it points to a worldwide flood creating the atmosphere, the change of climate, the uh, water, uh, and so that there would be an Ice Age. At the end of the Ice Age, that period of time also overwhelmingly points towards creation. Let's take a look. Top of the page. The post-flood period continued. Evidence of Ice Age points to a recent catastrophic worldwide flood. And we have the end of the Ice Age. We've looked at the period of, of the Ice Age and what signs we have there we can determine and which side do we favor, evolution or creation? It seems to be overwhelming for creation. Now, sudden warming of the climate is the first thing that we might take notice. Geophysical and paleontological evidence indicate that the glacial age ended rather suddenly. Both the evidence of foraminiferal types, meaning different species inhabit, inhabit cold waters and warm waters, and oxygen isotope composition in the carbonate of their shells. <coughs> the ratios of those isotopes is also dependent upon water temperature. Unite in indicating a somewhat sharp change from glacial to temperate conditions. Emiliani writes, the data indicate a rather sudden change from more or less stable glacial conditions to post-glacial conditions. Erickson, Broker, Culp, and Wolin. Other lines of evidence, such as a sudden change from deposition of sand to silt in the Mississippi Delta and a rapid desiccation of pluvial lakes, all dated more or less simultaneously, point to, or to the same conclusion. And Richard Russell, authority on Mississippi Basin Geology, says, in summary, shoreline irregularity and the alluvial filling of valleys indicate a recent general rise of sea level. Comparatively, small areas of deltas and topograph top topographic, topographic, topographic instability along coasts which is evidenced by rapid advance of delta fronts and anomalous features such as Sepanica Lake suggests that the rise in level in the sea level has been rapid. Russell again says, this is from the instability of sea level, American scientist. Still more recently, geologists from Columbia's Lamont Geological Laboratories have recently noted, geologically speaking, of this sudden warming of the Earth's temperatures. Their evidence shows, from the evidence listed above, which they write, it is clear that a major fluctuation in climate occurred close to 11,000 years ago. That's their estimate. The primary observation that both surfaces of ocean temperatures and sea sediment rates were abruptly altered at this time and supplemented by evidence from more local systems. The level of the Great Basin Lakes fell from the highest terraces to a position close to that observed at present. Silt and clay load of the Mississippi River were suddenly retained in the alluvial valley and delta. A rapid ice retreat opened the northern drainage systems of the Great Lakes and terrestrial temperatures rose to nearly interglacial levels in Europe. In each case, the transition is the most obvious feature of the entire record. Broker, Ewing, Heason, they wrote, is obvious from our previous discussion of the radiocarbon dating assumptions that the 11,000 year date must be too high. And so these worldwide events clearly date from about the time of the flood and its after effects. Neither was this warming of the earth a gradual process occupying thousands or millions of years. 
Evidence from a number of geographically isolated systems suggested that the warming which occurred at the close of Wisconsin glacial times was extremely abrupt. These are not creationists saying this. It seems there must have been a rather abrupt warming of the climate in order for the glaciers to melt and the oceanic temperature to change as rapidly as the evidence indicates. This again argues for some sort of explanation <clears throat> outside of the scope of doctrinaire uniformitarianism. The flood events, and particularly the associated atmospheric changes, can once again suggest a cause adequate to explain this event. Goes on, most of the incident solar energy is contained in the visible radiation which can penetrate right through the atmosphere. The Earth re emits the energy it receives from the Sun, but being a much cooler body, it does so mainly in the infrared region of the spectrum. Infrared radiation is strongly absorbed by water vapor, carbon dioxide, and ozone. These constituents therefore act like the glass of a greenhouse. They trap the outgoing energy. And now the effect is of the utmost importance, for without it, the mean surface temperature would be lower by almost 40 degrees centigrade, and life could not exist. D.R. Bates, Composition and Structure of the Atmosphere. And the Earth and its atmosphere, D.R. Bates, says, These three constituents, water vapor, ozone, and carbon dioxide, must have been present in large amounts and the post-antediluvian atmosphere. The first water vapor we have already discussed in connection with the infrared canopy, the waters above the firmament, actually the, uh, the frozen water above the firmament, which was so cold that it became ice, translucent to, to uh, light. So the sunlight was let in except it blocked the uh, radiation and uh, the um, dangerous radiation, and uh, it kept the uh, air in the atmosphere about 30% higher in oxygen. So this guy goes on to say, ozone would have been formed by reaction to the sun's ultraviolet radiation with molecules of oxygen and water vapor as at present. What I say here about the radiation, the ultraviolet. However, the equilibrium amount of ozone in the atmosphere depends also on the temperature of the atmosphere, so that the location of the antediluvian ozonosphere, where the ozone was, may have been different from the present. The amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is a function of the amount of carbon producing and carbon extracting mechanisms on the Earth's surface. How many plants and trees? Through the process of photosynthesis, carbon dioxide is taken out of the air and used in plant growth then return to the air through the process of expiration, decay, excreta, burning, and so on. Also, the waters of the ocean exchange carbon dioxide with the atmosphere, the amount increasing as the surface temperature increases. The formation of carbonates in rocks and shells, as well as their weathering out and returning to the atmosphere, also enter the cyclic balance. The amount in the interdiluvian atmosphere must have been very high in order to maintain equilibrium with the large amounts of plant life. Large amount, the large amount of continental relative to oceanic areas and the large amount of carbonate fixing organisms in the sea. The effect of this large carbon dioxide and ozone concentration in the antediluvian atmosphere augmented the side effect of the canopy, the ice canopy, overhead and maintaining the global green, greenhouse effect and in shielding the earth from horrible harmful short wave length radiation, including ultraviolet, coming from the sun in outer space. Now with the flood, these balances were all profoundly modified. The vast areas of plants were buried and their carbon content was concentrated in coal seams. Suddenly, extensive bodies of organic materials were converted into petroleum hydrocarbons. The deluge precipitated the atmospheric ozone and carbon dioxide in all probability, along with the canopy, temporarily, partially denuding the atmosphere of these constituents. So point B, post-flood, post-ice post age. The abundant carbon dioxide produced plant growth and a rise in temperature, ending the ice age. 
the lowering of the atmospheric temperature after the flood as a result of these atmospheric changes, especially in higher latitudes, certainly supplies a potent mechanism for initiating glaciation of continental magnitudes. A single ice age worldwide. The carbon dioxide remaining in the air would support only limited plant life. As compared with the luxuriant pre-flood stands and their only limited animal life as well. However, in time, there was no doubt but that the shielding effect of the firmament canopy, the ice canopy overhead, which created the 40 days and 40 nights of rainfall, would have been at least in part restored by the formation of the following. The ozonosphere would have soon formed in essentially its present character once the new hydraulic cycle was established and more or less stabilized. More important, as plants and animals began to grow again and gradually to multiply, the life processes would gradually restore carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, approaching the balance that has in general characterized present times. Along with this, carbon dioxide equilibrium between ocean and atmosphere required gradual discharge of the gas from the ocean into the air. Further, volcanic sources undoubtedly yielded a certain amount of the to the atmosphere as well. And all this, in turn, would have caused a gradual rise in terrestrial temperatures, probably at an accelerating rate. One might think the destruction from the destruction of plant and animal life on the Earth's surface by the deluge would likewise have enriched the air with CO2 rather than reduced it through burning, burning and decomposition. However, most of the organic matter was evidently trapped in the sediments and buried. But undoubtedly, many of the higher animals must have floated on the waters after death, finally decaying and there, thereby have contributed to the atmospheric reservoir of carbon dioxide. Likewise, much plant life also must have decayed on the surface without burial. There is no doubt, therefore, that in view of the sparsity of living organisms on the earth in the early years after the flood, there was all, but there was an excess of carbon dioxide over that necessary to support whatever life might be able to grow. And as the much reduced continental areas began to be repopulated by both plant and animal life, and as seawater gave up a portion of its excess CO2 into the atmosphere, it is highly probable that the CO2 content of the atmosphere began to increase, and thereby terrestrial temperatures likewise. Another factor may have also been involved. We have seen that a great amount of tech volcanic activity occurred during the flood. This activity, which is evidenced by the tremendous amounts of volcanic rocks found associated with the strata of all geologic systems, must have released an indefinitely large amount of carbon dioxide gas. Much of this was released beneath the waters and probably contributed chemically to the formation of the extensive carbonate rock deposits, but also much may have been released above the ground and added to the atmospheric carbon reservoir. In addition, after the flood, although the high intensity of volcanic activity was restrained, there continued to be much more activity than occurs at present, as witnessed by the large amount of lava and ash beds that have been found, which can be reasonably attributed to post-flood time period. Although the volcanic eruptions thus may have made a substantial contribution to the post-flood, post-deluge increment of CO2 in the air, this effect was undoubtedly masked and more than offset for a time by the fine dust that was also discharged into the air by the volcanic actions. This volcanic dust served to reduce the insulation, the amount of solar energy reaching the Earth's surface. We call that at Mount St. Helens. In fact, the volcanic dust discharged into the air by the intense volcanic activity near the beginning of the so-called period named Pleistocene has been one of the main theories advocated by as an explanation of the glacial age. It may well have been a contributing factor along the removal of the ice canopy by the flood to the initiation of the active actual glaciation. Dr. Wexler of the U.S. Bureau, Weather Bureau, one of the chief advocates of this theory, estimates that the solar radiation reaching the ground may be reduced by as much as 20% by volcanic dust after a severe eruption. We've seen that at Mount Hunter at St. Helens. We can go more at this next time.